We've seen that trig functions can let us go from an angle into a ratio of sides. But what if we want to go the other way? What if we want to know what, uh, what if we know what we want a trig function to produce and we uh, want to figure out what input would make that trig function produce that output? Just for an example, um, consider this question. What input x would make the function sine of x be 3 over 4? In other words, what we're really asking here is, or if we could find such an x, then sine of x would be 3 over 4. So really, we're trying to find x in this situation. Well, this might sound familiar. The situation where you know an output and you uh, want to figure out the input, you can switch the input and the output if you know the inverse function. I guess for sine, we would call that sine inverse like this. Okay, so we could find the x value we want if we had an inverse function, if only we had an inverse function for sine. So I guess that prompts the question, is there an inverse function for sine? Well, we have some tools to uh, think about inverse functions that we figured out in pre-calc 1. Let's use those tools. Um, we know that there is an inverse function Uh, just a reminder that inverse means an inverse function and not a reciprocal. We know that there is an inverse function uh, for some function f of x exactly when the function f of x is 1 to 1. And 1 to 1 is just a fancy way of saying every output of the function is associated with exactly one input. Well, there's a nice way to check that if we sketch a graph of the function. So let's sketch a graph of sine. Sine looks like this. It's not exactly right, but it's close enough. Remember, the uh, unmodified sine function goes up to 1, down to minus 1, and it goes through a complete cycle in 2 pi. And after that cycle, it repeats itself because it's periodic. So it looks like this. And to check if a function is one to one, what you ask yourself is, for every output value, is there only one input value? So we were asking, just for an example of an output value, we were asking about this value, this output value 3 over 4. So to figure out if there's only one input that corresponds to this output, we should sketch a horizontal line like this and see if there are how many inputs there are, how many horizontal positions there are that put the graph on this output, this uh, height, 3 over 4. And you can see there are actually many inputs for the sine function that produce the output 3 over 4. In fact, there are infinitely many of them because this function is periodic. If you find one, then you could go forward a period to have another one. So uh, the sine function is not 1 to 1. 1-1 one one is my abbreviation for 1 to 1. So since the sine function is not 1 to 1, that means it doesn't have an inverse. Well, if sine doesn't have an inverse, this really... Uh, really messes up our hope of, of finding this x value so that sine of x is 3 over 4. Right? If we had a sine function or an inverse function for sine, this would be no problem. But there, we've just shown that there is no inverse function for sine. But, you know, we shouldn't give up too easily. The problem is that this sine function, it it just keeps going infinitely far in both directions, and it repeats itself. If we could just somehow make this graph not repeat itself, then we could get, uh, then maybe we could force this graph to be one-to-one. -one. Well, 
we'd like to keep as much of the graph as possible. So let's see. Let's keep this point at the origin, I guess. Just the point at the origin is one to one because uh, every horizontal line there, uh, touches the origin at most once. We can keep some, some of the graph to the right. As we move to the right, right, if we're only keeping this red part of the graph, this red part is one to one because it touches each output only once. But we could keep more of the graph than this. We could go to the right a little bit further, all the way up to this top point. And this red part of the graph is still one to one. We can't go any further than this because if we continued past this top point to this blue portion of the graph, well, now there are uh, vertical positions that intersect this graph more than once, right? Once on the left here and once on the right. So we can't go past this top red point. Of course, we could get more of the graph by going to the left from the origin instead of to the right. So we can continue to the left and we still aren't repeating any heights, any output values. We could go all the way down to this bottom point. So again, this red part of the graph is one-to-one. -one, and if we tried to keep any more of the graph, it would not be one-to-one. -one. So this is the most of the graph that we can keep. And let's see, what parts of the graph are this? This is from Let's see, the bottom of the first time we get down to the minimum on the graph of sine here is at minus pi over 2. And the first time we get up to this maximum value is at pi over 2. So for sine, we are only going to keep the interval from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. We're actually throwing away most of the graph of sine. Uh, this interval, I call this the restricted domain of sine. Of course, the actual domain of sine is all real numbers, but here we've done some surgery to throw away most of the domain, and we're only keeping from minus pi over 2 to plus pi over 2. Okay, now that we've decided to keep just this interval of input values, uh, we can uh, now be guaranteed that the red graph up there is one-to-one. -one. And since it's one-to-one, -one, it has an inverse. And we'll call it inverse sine, and we'll write it like this, sine and then a little minus 1 uh, of x, like this. Now, this notation is a little bit confusing because this makes it look like, you know, usually this would be an exponent, and this would mean 1 over sine of x, but that is not what that little minus 1 up there means. Okay, this, that would be a reciprocal. But an inverse function is not a reciprocal, at least not usually. So it looks like an exponent, but it, this is not an exponent. It just means that we're talking about the inverse function of sine. Let's sketch this inverse function. I, so remember the, uh, the piece of the sine graph we're keeping is like this. It goes up to 1 and down to minus 1. And this happens on the interval from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. So this is sine. So now let's sketch a graph of inverse sine. Well, remember, you can get from the graph of a function to the graph of its inverse just by reflecting over the line uh, y equals x. Reflecting over the, uh, over the line y equals x has the effect of uh, swapping x values and y values, and uh, that has this effect of swapping input values and output values, and that's exactly what inverse functions do. So for every point over here on the graph of sine, there's a corresponding point on the graph of inverse sine. So for example, this point all the way at the left, 
This is minus pi over 2, comma, minus 1. If we just swap the uh, x and y coordinates for this point, we get a point for the graph of inverse sine. So our old point was minus pi over 2, comma, minus 1. That means our new point should be minus 1 in the x direction and minus pi over 2 in the y direction. So there's a point on inverse sine. On the graph of sine, 0, 0 is on the graph. That's right at the origin. And if you swap those x and y coordinates, you get 0, 0 again. So that's on the graph of inverse sine. And then let's do one more, at least one more. This far right point is pi over 2, comma 1 on the graph of sine. And so on the graph of inverse sine, switch x and y coordinates. That gives you 1 for the x coordinate and pi over 2 for the y coordinate. And that gives us this point up here. Now, having just three points doesn't give you a, a lot of information about the, what the graph looks like. But um, now that we sort of have these points as a, a framework, we can think a little bit more about reflecting over the line y equals x. Remember, the line y equals x is this line right here. And if you imagine reflecting this graph over the blue line, it's, it sort of swoops initially rightwards, then upwards, then rightwards. Well, after you reflect, it's going to swoop upwards, then rightwards, then upwards. So it's going to look something like this. So here's a graph of inverse sine. All right. Um, it, you can see why we had to throw away most of the graph of sine, right? The whole graph of sine continues on here. Well, if you reflected that, it would, the graph of inverse sine would sort of go back to the left like this, but this is no longer the graph of a function because it doesn't pass the vertical line test. So that's sort of conceptually why we had to throw away most of the graph of sine to get uh, inverse sine. All right, um, immediately from this graph, we can tell a couple things about inverse sine. First of all, its domain. Well, its domain, those are just the input values on the horizontal axis, and that's from minus 1 to 1, including minus 1 and 1. And the range, those are the possible output values. And the, uh, those are on the vertical axis, so that's from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. Notice that these are the domain and range of sine, except they've switched, and the, it's not the whole domain of sine, it's the restricted domain of sine. Um, so the inverse function just switched inputs and output values, which is no surprise because that's what an inverse function is. Now that we have a, a definition of inverse sine, let's look at a couple examples of actually calculating some values for, in, for inverse sine. So let's start with inverse sine of a half. Okay. Well, if you want to find inverse sine of a half, there are a couple ways of thinking about it. So one way is <clears throat> think of the most important diagram. And you can make this diagram be a unit circle. That's a nice thing to do because in a unit circle, sine of theta is the y-coordinate. So um, that means inverse sine of y is going to be theta. Remember, inverse functions switch inputs and outputs. So we can, if we can draw a picture where this y-value is a half, we'll have a picture of the angle theta. The y-value of a half is right here. And that gives us this angle. So there's our angle theta. Of course, the diagram doesn't tell us exactly what angle this is, but I hope that this value that sine is producing, 1 half, seems familiar. Uh, we know an angle in the first quadrant that makes sine be equal to a half, and that's pi over 6. So this must be pi over 6. Okay, that's one way to figure out what sine is. We got a little lucky in this uh, in this example because it happened to be an angle that we knew. 
<clears throat> Another way to look at calculating the same thing is, is this. So we were trying to find inverse sine of a half. We don't know initially what this angle is. We're going to pretend, as we do this again, that we don't know what it is. So let's name it theta. Now that we have a name for theta, we can calculate with it. One thing we could do is try to get back to the original function just by applying sine to both sides. On the left-hand side, sine and inverse sine undo each other because they're inverse functions, and so we just get a half. And on the right-hand side, we get sine of theta. So again, this tells us we're looking for some angle, and you know because theta is coming out of inverse sine, it has to be between minus pi over two and pi over two. So we're looking for some angle between minus pi over two and pi over two, whose sine is a half. But there's only one such angle. It has to be in the first quadrant, otherwise its sine would be negative. And the only angle in the first quadrant whose sine is a half is pi over six. Okay, so there are a couple ways to think about calculating inverse sine. If it's one of these values like one half that we happen to sort of already know. Uh, just to have another, another look at a similar example, let's find inverse sine of negative square root of two over two. So again, you can name this angle. And then if you need to, you can switch inputs and outputs to go from inverse sine back to the original sign. So we're looking for an angle theta whose sine is negative square root of two over two. And as before, theta has to be between minus pi over two and pi over two. So we're, uh, because this value for sine is negative, Right, we know we're between minus pi over two and pi over two, but because this value for sine is negative, we actually have to be in the fourth quadrant because sine takes positive values in the first quadrant. So we're looking for an angle in the fourth quadrant whose sine is minus root two over two. Hopefully that's one that you, that's a value for sine that you recognize. It's this angle right here. And that is minus pi over 4. Notice that it's actually minus pi over 4. It is not 7 pi over 4. 7 pi over 4 would be this big counterclockwise angle. But that angle is not between minus pi over 2 and plus pi over 2. So. It's not 7 pi over 4. So we do have to be a little careful about inverse trig functions um, because coterminal angles aren't good enough. All right, so that's how we can um, build inverse sine and calculate a few values for inverse sine. Of course, these few values of inverse sine that we calculated, um, we were able to calculate them just because we got lucky. The value that was in the inverse sine was sort of nice. The two examples that we looked at, one half and minus root two over two, those were nice values to put into inverse sine. But what if it's a, not a nice value? What if it's something like three over four, like the example that we started with at the very beginning? Well, <clears throat> uh, there's no easy way to approximate what, or there's no easy way to figure out exactly what uh, this would be. There's no easy way to figure out exactly what angle would make the output for sine be 3 over 4, and so you just have to use a calculator. What you'll find is that your scientific calculator has inverse and inverse sine button. Uh, it's usually a second function on your sine key. Notice that because you are, uh, because the output of inverse sine is an angle, uh, your, cal your scientific calculator will tell you this angle either in degrees or radians, depending on the angle mode it's in. So when you use an inverse sine button, be sure that you're in the angle mode that you want to be in.
All right, so that's inverse sine. Well, you can bet that we could play exactly the same game with inverse cosine. And that's what I'm going to ask you to do. So for the function cosine, do exactly what we did for sine. Sketch, first sketch the graph of cosine. Then you, you'll see that uh, it's not one-to-one. -one. So choose a smaller domain for cosine so that it is one-to-one. -one. And remember to keep as much of the original graph of cosine as possible. Once you've chosen the part of the graph that you're keeping, then sketch that part of the inverse function. And while you're at it, once you, uh, once you have the, a graph for your inverse cosine function, evaluate these two values for your inverse cosine function, inverse cosine of minus a half and inverse cosine of zero. And in the next video, we will, uh, I will run through these just to make sure that we are all on the same page.